Well, Donald Trump may have seen something coming. He may have been prescient when in 2017 he spoke about what a post-Trump media world would look like. He said at the time, newspapers, television, all forms of media will tank if I'm not there, because without me, their ratings are going down the tubes. Viewed from a variety of perspectives, if I just think about the different platforms that I'm involved with, I can see sign of decline that I think is unmistakable since the tumultuous, you know, Trump years ended at the White House. I'll give you an example. I got an email from James Meadows, who is the terrific editor of Smirconish.com and our corresponding daily newsletter, alerting me to the fact that we saw a 7.32% decline in the rate of people opening links at my website and newsletter for last month. A decline of 7.32%. I was thrilled because I had feared worse. The newsletter, it continues to attract registrants, but that pace has slowed. Also, every Tuesday, I get an email from my executive producer at CNN, Catherine. She's terrific. It's kind of funny. We go back and forth because... I'm forever saying, oh my God, look at that P2 number, only to hear her response, which is to say, well, yeah, but in 25 to 54, I mean, I'm a 59-year-old guy going out and buying, you know, sweaters that are lavender. Who is it that thinks that if you're 59, you don't have purchasing power? All the attention is on the 25 to 54-year-olds. So that's the game we have to play. The P2 number is the total number of people who are listening And my P2 number, you know, dwarfs my number in the demo. Obviously, you don't want viewers who are very old exclusively because they're not out purchasing. I just think that the uh, the advertising biz discounts those who are not yet seniors, but not exactly in the demo. Anyway, so she shares with me on a Tuesday my ratings. And I pay close attention to them. I run my finger down a column and I see what happened at CNN in the 9 to 10 o'clock hour. And there has definitely been a decline in my numbers that I attribute to the fact that we were all caught up in Trump and, well, impeachment in Trump in the January 6th attempted insurrection, then the events of January 20. And if I chart where I was then versus where I am now, for sure there's been a decline. Uh, November 3rd was a Tuesday. It was also Election Day. So I received ratings on November 3rd for the prior Saturday, and I see that I had 1.189 million people, one point, let's call it 1.2 to round, 1.2 million people watching, 288,000 in the demo. On January 20, also a Tuesday, Inauguration Day, I received ratings for the prior Saturday, so where was I then? 1.7 million, 300,000 who were watching in the demo. Let me just see. Uh, If I go back just a couple of weeks, I see that um, I'm now at a million, 1.1 million, 225 in the demo. Where was I on Saturday? Saturday. Jeez, everybody was down. And Fox, I can see that Fox has regained where they were. The numbers are now below $200,000, $200,000, 200,000 in the, uh, in the demo. Um, we don't get ratings here at Sirius XM. You know, the company line is that we're a subscriber network. We're not dependent upon the competition. We don't need them, therefore, and we don't have them. I don't know if I believe that. It's nice not to be held accountable for the, the ebb and the flow of quarterly ratings like I used to live by on terrestrial radio, you know, AM, conventional talk radio. As a talk radio host... I think an acquired skill set is to be able to dismiss and not live by call volume. That's another metric that's you know out there and hard to dismiss, but you have to do it. Uh, I know you're out there. I'm here, and we can't see each other. You can hear me, and you certainly know that I'm here. But how do I know you're out there? Well, the instant gratification, the sort of Pavlovian response are the blinking telephone lines that I'm looking at right now on a computer in front of me. 
And TC and Dan can attest that we don't want for calls during our program. Uh, there are days every once in a while that, and honestly, I've, I've said to TC on the very infrequent occasions, wow, that was a provocative topic and the calls were there, but not in the volume I anticipated. Maybe it's the moon. Like, who knows? You know, so, something inexplicably, like every six months, there'll just be something that's a little bit off, no matter the, the news cycle. But usually it's a very steady hum, which is why I'm forever doing lightning rounds and trying to clear the board to make sure the people who've been on hold for a, a long time get through. Uh, I don't like the idea of you calling and then holding and not getting on. If you call and you get a busy signal, well, I don't have the same guilt about that. Anyway, I bring up my personal metrics in part for transparency, but for a reason. And the reason is that Donald Trump was, was good for business. There's no doubt about it. Donald Trump was good copy, I think, for all in the media. And Paul Farhi at the Washington Post just wrote a great piece in which he said this, of all of Donald Trump's prophecies and predictions that Mexico would pay for a border wall, that the coronavirus would spontaneously disappear, that he would be easily reelected, at least one wasn't entirely wrong. And then he repeats the quote that I shared with you at the outset. Newspapers, television, all forms of media will tank if I'm not there, he augured in 2017, because without me, their ratings are going down the tubes. And then Farhi, commenting on his own employer, the Washington Post, says, after a record-setting January, traffic to the nation's most popular mainstream news sites, including the Washington Post, plummeted in February. The top sites were also generally doing worse in February of last year when the pandemic became a major international news story. The Post saw the number of unique visitors fall 26% from January to February and 7% from a year ago. The New York Times lost 17% compared with January, 16% over February. And the story is largely the same for cable and broadcast news. Audiences grew, drew, audiences grew during the pandemic last spring and summer. They remained high in the fall as Trump tried to fight his electoral defeat with false claims of voter fraud, swelled in the first few weeks of 2021 when the mob attacked the Capitol. Trump became the first president in history to be impeached and acquitted twice. But now that Joe Biden's in the White House, things have changed. The most deeply affected network is CNN, writes Paul Farhi. After surpassing rivals Fox News and MSNBC in January, the network lost 45% of its primetime audience in the past five weeks. MSNBC's numbers dropped 26% in the same period. Fox News, the most Trump-friendly of the three networks in its primetime opinion shows, has essentially regained its leading position by standing still. And I think there's truth in that. And then they go through the numbers of, of what has been happening at, uh, at Fox News. What's, what's interesting is that, and this is the takeaway, what's interesting is that, I guess two takeaways. One is that there's less intense viewing and participation post-Trump, which was totally predictable, I think, especially when you, you compare uh, Biden and the news flow that he provides versus Trump and the action from his Twitter feed alone. But one other observation, it's not just that, that everything is going down, it's that in the media biz, and this is really important because this fits with my overall narrative and arc and what you hear from, from me on my program, it pays to be the party of opposition. It pays to be MSNBC when Trump is the president. It pays to be Fox News when Joe Biden is the president. The... The pinnacle, as I look back on terrestrial radio over the span of the last 30 years, for terrestrial meaning conventional AM talk radio, were the Clinton years. You know, Rush was at his peak and Drudge at his peak when Bill Clinton was the president and you had the intern scandal to provide, to provide everyday fodder. And what it fits with is my view that Sadly, what drives the discourse so often is to be opposed to whatever the status quo is 
and driving your audience, not with a message of reconciliation and the need to get things done and for the C word compromise. No, instead it's to stir the pot and attract, you know, eyes to websites and ears to radio programs and clicks to, to websites. Uh, it's not a, it's not a good thing that the media is being driven for this partisan purpose is what I'm trying to say. So the evergreen file soon will be back on my desk. It's kind of funny. The evergreen file. Uh, did you ever, uh, did you watch things? I wish I knew before I started talking, which is my one man stage show that uh, is available on a download. And by the way, may soon be coming to a streamer near you. I'm not permitted yet to discuss that. I have always viewed my job behind this microphone on radio as a blend of front page and Seinfeld Larry David material. You ask me the best radio that I've ever done, it would come from everyday life and not from the front page. That has, that has always been, you know, what did I most wish I knew when I started before I started? Uh, what did I most wish I knew before I started talking? If I could speak clearly now, I'd be able to tell you. Uh, it is that there's really something to be said for the Seinfeldian. There's really something to be said for the, the Larry David approach. And when I'm out and about and leading my normal life and people will approach me and speak about radio shows of mine that struck a chord with them, it's never about a presidential interview. It's never about anything on the front page. You know, it's the every day that is unifying because we all have an opinion because you don't need to be a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal or a conservative to have an opinion on whatever the issue might be. But unfortunately, when it comes to ratings, passion moves the needle. And in the media, it's good to be the party of opposition. So Fox is going to do well in the Biden years. You know, they, they, they might not have an incumbent president calling the show, but he'll the, the former president will still be calling a show and they will be the they, they will be the loyal opposition and they will drive passion no greater example of what i'm talking about than the situation right now with immigration and the border uh, the question is whether disengagement of the type that i outlined is good or bad for us as a society are we better served when more of us are paying attention or when now we're all of a sudden going back to our day-to-day -day lives and with the pandemic almost behind us, you know, looking forward to some sense of normalcy. Less engagement is what we are now witnessing. Less engagement. I like when everybody's engaged, because when everybody's engaged, we who are somewhere in the middle can dissipate the influence of the fringes. That's why I would love full engagement through voting, through listening to radio, through watching tell. I want everybody to have skin in the game. Because when everybody goes back to what they were doing, the most passionate few who tend to reside at the far extremes of the ideological spectrum, they then have outsized influence. That's the story about declining ratings. <laughs>